And uh, go ahead, it's all yours. Okay, so hi everybody. Thanks so much for joining my session. So you want to be a food writer. It's a real honor to be part of the Japan Writers Conference today. I'm Melinda Joe, a journalist specializing in food and drinks based in Tokyo, but originally from the US. I've been working as a full-time freelance food writer for more than 10 years now. And every time I talk about what I do, almost always the first reaction from people is, oh my God, that must be a dream job. And you know, to be fair, that's not totally false. <laughs> it does really have its perks. Um, whenever I think about my job, I always think this work is a privilege and I absolutely mean it because um, it is. And you know, to be able to go to places and write about interesting people, to talk to interesting people and share their stories and then get paid for it. It is, it can only be described as a privilege. Um, because of my job, I've been able to meet some of the world's most fascinating people and have absolutely insane experiences that I would never be able to manage on my own. Um, for example, I have just returned from Moscow. And when I say I've just returned, I mean literally like yesterday I arrived in Tokyo from Moscow. So you will forgive me if I am a little bit less, um, a little bit, you know, less coherent than I would normally be because I am suffering from really terrible jet lag right now. But prior to the pandemic, I used to travel all the time. Um, it was really common for me to be overseas um, once a month or um, sometimes even more than that. But I um, haven't left the country since February, 2020. Um, this was my first time out of the country. And I went there because of the launch of the Michelin Guide to Moscow. Before that, I had visited this, I had visited Moscow about five years ago. And so it was really exciting to see how the culinary scene there is developing and the way that different people are approaching issues like sustainability, um, cultural, um, cultural heritage, cultural identity, and then to compare that to the way that, that food is thought about both in Japan and other countries as well. And the food was great. Uh, plus, I got to eat a lot of caviar and drink a lot of champagne, which is pretty much my favorite thing to do in life. Um, so, as I said, my work is a privilege and my work has changed my perspective on on the world by bringing me in touch with so many different cultures. Um, on my first big assignment in 2010, I traveled to Lapland in Finland to write about reindeer farming for a magazine called Real Eats. Then for the Atlantic on that same trip, I covered an event called Cook It Raw, where I went foraging and hunting with some of the world's top chefs like Rene Redzepi, David Chang and Alex Atala. This was such a huge experience for me because it was my first foray into, into dining at this, uh, into cuisine at this kind of level. And it really opened my eyes to the world of fine dining. Um, it's also the place where the trend of chef's collaborations and this kind of really like, this kind of free creativity and global food culture, like global fine dining culture, started. So it's been hugely influential on my work. And it's kind of the reason why I do so much specialization in the sector of fine dining now. But also another really memorable experience I had was in 2015, when I visited the Faroe Islands, which is between Norway and Scotland, um, to write about the way that their food culture has evolved over time. Um, it is such a, it is such an isolated place and it has a, such a highly specific food culture. It's extremely fascinating. And the Faroe Islands themselves are just the most spectacular place. 
because they're really hard to get to. And if you're traveling by plane, then you're gonna go through the, like basically a storm because it's always kind of raining on the Faroe Islands. So I remember being in the plane with like so much turbulence, just cloud cover everywhere and then lightning then suddenly the Faroe Islands themselves just emerged from the sea of clouds and they're emerald green and um, rainbows are everywhere. So I felt like I was flying into the, the, like into the Hobbit or something like that. And um, it, it, it was a truly unforgettable experience. Um, but perhaps one of my most memorable experiences was in 2019, where I served on the inspections team for a program called the World Restaurant Awards. Um, and the category that I was working in was called Off the Map. So I traveled to five continents in the span of about of a month to visit five restaurants. And it was an exhilarating but exhausting experience. Um, I, remember flying from Tokyo to um, to somewhere around Newcastle via Dubai and then the next and then like just like one or two days later flying to Cape Town and then Amsterdam and on and on and on until um, coming back to Japan. So um, <clears throat> while all of this probably sounds quite amazing, um, and it is, it's really only the tiniest fraction of what it actually, of what is actually involved in the work of food writing. Um, the rest of it is far less glamorous. And I think that there are many, many myths about what it means to be a food writer. So I'm just gonna go through a handful of them and basically bust them all. I'll talk for a little while and then we'll open up for questions. Okay, so myth number one, a food writer is the same thing as a restaurant critic. Of course, restaurant reviews are everywhere. And increasingly we see the trend of a lot of food, of a lot of what people think of as food writing or a lot of what is being published um, being these like listicle type articles um, that, that make people always assume that food writing is just one thing. But food is a topic that touches every aspect of life. And so when we think about food or when we talk about food, we're not just talking about like what is on the plate at a restaurant. Um, food encompasses history, agriculture, issues of distribution, um, politics, culture, technology, all of these things in addition to taste and sensory perception, which is what a lot of people think of the work of, of being a food writer is. Um, and as a result of that, um, food writing can take a lot of different forms. I mean, it can be personal um, in the form of essays or memoirs. For example, I'm, maybe some of you attended the attended the session with um, the panel with Hannah Kirshner, who's recent memoir, um, Water, Wood, and Wild Things, is a really wonderful example of very personal writing um, uh, that, that talks about her life through the lens of food and, and, um, and food culture. Um, it can also, but food writing can also be academic and appear in academic and scientific journals. Uh, one book that I really recommend that is not a new book, but one that I recently kind of read is called Devouring Japan that looks at Japanese cuisine um, from the aspects of sociology and anthropology. And it's really it's really well done and it's fascinating. Of course, food writing can also be recipes and cookbooks. Um, it can be history and cultural commentary. Uh, in the food writing world right now, there's a lot of discussion around issues about cultural appropriation and colonialism. And I think these are really important topics and I'm very glad that we as an industry are finally starting to address some of this. My personal work um, 
is a lot of profiles. So profiles of people, but not only chefs, I mean, really everybody kind of related to the industry, um, but also places I consider some of the writing that I do to be a, a profiles of places. Um, I visit and write about a lot of producers. So that means farmers, sake makers, wine makers, spirits makers, and other kinds of artisans. Um, I also deal with topics related to sustainable food production um, and kind of more food culture in a wider context. Myth number two, you must go to journalism school to actually be a journalist. Well, I didn't. And to be honest, I don't know a lot of people who really recommend going to journalism school who are working as journalists now. Um, journalism school is an extraordinary investment. And um, quite frankly, a lot of people find that it doesn't have a significant return on investment. So um, from my, from my side, um, the way that I started writing was that I moved to Japan and I started working at Tokai University teaching English and very quickly discovered that I did not have a talent for that work. So at the same time, I have always been interested in food. I mean, I come from a food background. My family had a restaurant when I was a child and if, being Chinese American, food has always been a very important part of my life. But um, I was always uh, also interested in wine and sake. So I began learning about wine and sake. And then I started write, writing a blog called Tokyo Through the Drinking Glass to kind of help me process what I was learning and to just have like something that was a side thing that was fun for me to do um, that was completely unrelated to the work I was doing. Because of that blog or through that blog, I got contacted by a lot of editors who asked me if I could write some articles about Tokyo or mm -hmm. about Japan. And then gradually I began to specialize in food and drinks. So there are lots of avenues into doing this kind of work. Myth number three, as a food writer, your entire job is eating. Oh, if only this were true. However, unfortunately, um, every story involves a pretty complicated process. And that process always begins with an idea. Um, once you have a good idea, then you need to do some preliminary research. Then once you've done that, you need to do some market research. And what I mean by market research is that you need to think about your audience. Like who is this, who is the audience for this particular story? Who will find this interesting? And then also which publications will this be appropriate for? Um, once you have done that work, then your next step is to find the right contacts the right editorial contacts and create a pitch, which I'm pretty sure everybody here knows what a pitch is, but if not, please ask me later. Um, send it and follow up. Almost always you're gonna to have to follow up. And once you actually have the assignment, that's when your research begins, the process of research begins in earnest. Um, when we talk about research, you wanna focus as much as you can on primary sources, but, um, but of course, you know, you're also gonna to have to keep in mind what kind of article it is, what is the length and how much in depth you really need to go. Um, almost, well, at least in the work that I do almost always, I'm going to need to do interviews and it's usually going to be between three to five interviews. Um, Again, depending on the kind of the kind of article and the kind of publication. Once you finish the interview process, then you need to do the transcription. Um, and only after you've completed all that do you even begin the writing process. 
finally, <laughs> um, once you turn in the, the copy, the, the next step is the editing process, which is usually one or two rounds of amendments. Uh, but again, depends on the publication. It could be many more than that, or it could be none. Um, and if you're a freelance writer, then your work is not finished at that point. You will then need to send in your invoice. And then unfortunately, a lot of times you may end up chasing late payments. Okay, myth number four. If you become a food writer, you'll never pay for another meal. This is a very popular idea among people who are interested in becoming food writers, but please believe me, you will pay. And if you're living in Japan, you will pay a lot of money. Um, if you want to really understand food deeply, then you need to make that investment. And the investment is not always a huge amount of money, but it's an investment of time. And often, yes, it is an investment of money. And that doesn't only mean about um, eating at restaurants. It also means about, uh, it also means, you know, um, buying material, studying materials, um and taking classes all these kind of things that will will deepen your understanding and help you become a better food writer um of course there will be times that you receive invitations which is wonderful but particularly if you're based in japan it is a pretty rare occurrence so if the reason that you want to become a food writer is to eat at a bunch of fancy places and become friends with chefs, then I highly recommend that you get a job in finance because it will be a lot easier for you to achieve that goal than by becoming a food writer. Okay, myth number five. You have to write about fine dining to be a food, serious food journalist. Um, you know, fine dining is a very trendy and a very kind of sexy topic. So of course there's a lot of interest in that, but there are so many more exciting stories out there and ideas for articles. I believe that the most, I mean, I believe that the best topics are the ones that excite you or the ones that you're really interested in. Um, don't feel the pressure to write about what everybody else is talking about or go where everyone else is going. You know, I mean, if so many people are doing, then, doing that, then what is gonna make your story unique? I think um, there are lots of, there's, there's just so much that, that we're not talking about right now in the world of food writing that um, I think that we should be trying to present these stories that um, are not already being covered. Um, it, you, you know, it, a, a good story could be really any story, uh, you know, um, if you're in, really interested in like, for example, tea production and Shizuoka or like sustainable tuna, blue tuna, uh, bluefin tuna fishing, or sorry, farming in Wakayama, or like the history of Katsusando. I mean, all of these kind of things could make really interesting stories um, that are not being talked about. So just keep an open mind. Number six, you have to be a great cook to be a great food writer, to be a good food writer. No, but I think it helps. It, it helps to understand cooking and to, to do a little bit of yourself so that you can get that other perspective. Um, you don't have to go to culinary school um, or become a sommelier to be a food writer, but you certainly need to familiarize yourself with techniques and the vocabulary to describe the experiences that you are having. Um, how do you accomplish this? Well, there are, there are many, many um, resources out there and a lot of them for free, a lot of them accessible um, via the internet that you can start studying. And then the only other way to really get better is to practice. So just like with everything, practice, practice, practice. Myth number seven, you have to have a lot of Instagram followers to break into food writing. Okay, it's true that um, that some people 
do break into food writing um, this way, um, or even become influencers that get paid to post photos. While that's true, it is pretty unlikely for most people. So um, I don't think that you should make that a priority to try to get a lot of Instagram followers. However, I think it's absolutely important as a journalist of any kind to um, have a presence on social media. Um, for me, it's been one of the most effective ways of, um, of collecting professional contacts and um, getting a lot of assignments. Um, and also, you know, just making some friends that, are, that would be otherwise unknown to me or outside of my immediate circle. So um, I recommend Twitter. I'm particularly partial to Twitter. I am on Instagram, but um, I don't use it as much as I use Twitter. Um, LinkedIn, I heard about, I have heard that it is an extremely useful tool. Uh, particularly if you're looking for a staff job of sorts. Um, and I do use it, but to a lesser extent um, than Twitter. But especially if you're new to writing, your social media presence can be a good place or your social media channels can be a good place for editors to see what you're doing, uh, where your interests lie and what your particular specializations are. Um, and if you are lucky enough to have a lot of followers, then that's always going to be considered a good thing by editors, uh, by potential editors. In addition, um, I think it would be a very good idea to consider uh, creating your own website. And this is something that I haven't personally done, but so I'm kind of talking to myself here, but, um, but it is something I'm working on. And I, and I think it's a really good way for people to find you and you can showcase all of your work that way. Okay, myth number eight, you need a bunch of clips to start pitching. It always helps to have, to have clips. Um, and what I mean by clips is, is you know, examples it just means samples of your writing. But of course, if you're a new writer, then you're not going to have a lot of these clips because you haven't gotten any assignments yet. But um, you can still have a lot of good examples of your writing by starting a blog, creating a website, or by launching your own newsletter, which is something that a lot of even like seasoned journalists are doing these days. And it's something I'm thinking about doing myself as well. Um, but I just need a little bit more time for that. Um, but even something like uh, writing in to the newspaper and you know a, a letter to the editor, that might be even be something that could be used as a clip. But at any rate, the most like I, th I think that the best place to showcase your writing skills will be in the actual pitch that you send to editors your pitch should always show you in your best light. And if your pitch is good enough, then whether or not you have clips is really not um, relevant. Okay, myth number nine. It's always a good idea to write for exposure, meaning to write for free, especially if you're new to writing. There may be times where you will consider writing for writing for exposure, um, particularly if that enables you to do something that you know that you would not be able to do on your own, like take a trip or um, just you know have some really special experience. So you know, in that regard, it's really up to you. Um, however, I would urge anyone, but especially new writers, to consider that people die of exposure, okay? So it's not really something that's like, as a practice, good for you or good for the industry. And if more people, if more and more people are willing to write for free, then it devalues the work of professional writers. So my particular, um, you know, personal stance on this is that I don't do it. But again, there are times when you will consider 
doing it and it will be like, you know, um, for, for your own reasons. Myth number 10, newspapers and magazines are the only outlets that publish food writing. Of course, there are so many outlets that publish food writing. Um, there are many, many beyond the New York Times and food and wine. Um, particularly when we're talking about the food world, there are so many niche publications and so many new publications cropping up all the time. Um, just for example, I only, I only the day before yesterday discovered a new one called Eaton, and I think it might be published in the UK, which is interesting because they are trying to have a really um, a really diverse perspective, global perspective on food, um, and it's something that I'm going to check out more. Um, there are also there are also uh, newsletters such as um, the UK-based newsletter Vittles that um, actually pay competitive rates to writers and illustrators and are worth checking out. Also, government-sponsored websites uh, publish a lot of food content. So organizations like the JNTO, and increasingly there are like travel services that have a web channel that will be looking for food content, which is another possible outlet for food writers. So look beyond the food specific publications, a lot of general, a lot of general interest publications um, have food sections, but really any, any good story is a candidate for any publication, right? So um, when you're thinking about a food, food story, you can think about it from lots of different angles. So for example, does it have like a business angle or is there some sort of scientific technology component that you can really bring forward to make it attractive to a lot of a, a sort of wider net of, um, of publications? Trying to think about the topic in a, in a way that is like that has like a wider social significance is a good idea for every story. Myth number eleven: the best way to get editorial contacts is to ask other writers. Please don't do this unless you are actual friends with the person that you are asking. Um, there are a lot more efficient ways to get editorial contacts. Um, as I mentioned earlier. Social media is a really a powerful and effective tool. Um, so many editors are on social media and even will take pictures, will even take pitches through their direct messages. Um, and it's a good way to just, you know, begin to build a relationship. Um, otherwise, you know, I recommend buying publications and looking at the masthead where you can find the names of the different editors. And then, you know, just start Googling because you will often be able to either find that person's email contact or their social media channel. And then you can try and get in touch that way. Um, generally speaking, and it's not this way for everybody, but a lot of writers don't really love getting contacted and asked to share all, all of their editorial contacts. And like some people really don't mind, but some people really do. So I think it's better to not to avoid doing that unless you do have a personal relationship already. Um, another thing is that there are lots of organizations and um, like things like Facebook groups for that are open to the public where you can join and then try to share information that way, exchange information that way. Okay, myth number 12, it's not worth learning to take photos if you're a food writer. Increasingly, it's more important to have some sort of like basic photography skills. Um, that doesn't mean that you have to become a photographer, but it just means that you have to have some, you know, basic familiarity. Um, a lot of publications will not really consider the story if there's not some way for you, the writer, to source the images. And while that is really annoying, um, it is not something that you can't accomplish. You don't have to have, you know, super professional equipment. In some cases, even just nice pictures taken on your iPhone could suffice. 
Um, however, if you do decide to invest the time and energy in learning to take professional quality photos, that could really open up your opportunities to get into more photojournalism, which is also, you know, something that is a little different, but it is also really exciting. And, um, and frankly, it can be more lucrative than, than just, um, than just writing. Um, I would also say that it, I mean, it's not something that I have done myself, but um, but it's something I'm interested in. I would also say that it might be worth considering learning how to make videos and um, like other kinds of skills, even podcasting and things like that. If you are able to, if you are able to take your own photos for a story, then that's something you should definitely mention to editors. And um, that could mean that you get a higher rate, like you can negotiate a higher rate, or they may offer to buy the photos from you. Myth 13, editors prefer completed draft instead of a pitch. Okay, so in this, for this one, actually, if you are writing essays, then this can be true. Um, if you are, if you have a personal essay, for example, then it's more common to submit a completed draft rather than a pitch for an essay. But if it's anything that's not an essay, I would say that um, that it is not preferable to submit a completed draft. Um, editors are extremely busy, and if you submit a pitch that is, or if you submit anything that's like over a page, for example. I'm pretty sure it's almost guaranteed to be um, ignored. Myth number 14, your pitch should be as long and detailed as possible. Okay, um, keep your pitches to a minimum. They should be concise, they should be relevant to the publication and timely. But most importantly, they should, they should convey why you are the best person to write this story. So when you're thinking about making a pitch, like just remember the short formula, what is it? Like, what is the story? Why now and why you? And when you're thinking about the why you part, consider um, any specialized knowledge that you have or access to places or sources that would make you a really strong and the best candidate to write the story. Okay, myth number 15, the best food stories are about trendy topics. Um, as both a writer and a reader, I think that the best stories are the ones that teach me something new or enable me to think about something that I've never thought of or in a different way. Um, one example of, of a publication that, is a, that, that really does that is Gastro Obscura. Um, they, they write about quirky food stories from different parts of the world. And um, as their name suggests, they're often very obscure stories, but they're always interesting. Um, Another example that really came to mind as I was thinking about this is a story that my friend and colleague, Selena Hoy, wrote for the Japan Times recently about farmers in Aomori who are using geothermal power to grow strawberries. Um, this is actually an ancient technique that a lot of farmers used up in like the Tohoku region to kind of combat the cold climate there. And I I just thought it was a really well done story um, that is not anything about like has nothing to do about like trends, but um, was a fascinating piece and um, very enjoyable. Myth number 16, the most prestigious prestigious publications are the only ones you should care about. I mean, everybody loves the status that comes with a prestigious byline, but if you're a working writer, then at the end of the day, the most important thing is getting paid. And I'm sorry to say that that means a lot of writing and for a lot of different publications. Um, so, 
you know, you have to make sure that you have enough money to pay your rent, which you will then ultimately spend on food if you're a food writer. So um, you're going to have to cast a wide net. Um, consider smaller publications, local publications that would be a good place for um, stories relevant to your community. Um, and one thing I've been talking about a lot recently is working with trade publications or business to business publications that are often very easy to work with and offer good, offer good rates and pay promptly, which as a freelancer is a very big deal. Myth number 17, food writing turns you into a snob. If you're a serious food writer, then this profession will only widen your appreciation for food from all different of food of all different kinds and from all different cultures. Um, it will broaden your idea of what food is and what it means. Um, for this job, I have eaten so many things, and not all of them were exactly to my liking. For example, on the Faroe Islands, I ate fermented whale and cured whale blubber. That is to this day, one of the hardest things I've actually had to eat. Um, when I went to Oshima Island, I had kusaya at my own insistence and later a little bit to my own regret. Um, in Colombia, I had larvae, I've had guinea pig in Peru. And as I said, not all of it was always delicious, but it was always so interesting. And it always made me think in a different way. Um, all of these experiences gave me new understanding of how and why people eat what they eat. Um, just, uh, just another example recently is when I was in Moscow the other day, I had for the first time 3D generated squid and it was not actually made from squid, but it was so just absolutely fascinating. And um, now I'm really interested in like researching more and learning more about these kind of technology. So if I had, I don't think I would have necessarily chosen to do something like that on my own, but because it came to me through my work, then now it's, um, it's, an, it's another thing that has sparked my curiosity. Okay, myth number 18. Being a food writer limits you to writing about only food. Okay, of course, being a food writer doesn't limit you. Remember that food touches every aspect of life, which means that you will learn about a lot of different things all the time. And that's really the best part of the job. Um, I've done sponsored content, for example, for fashion brands. I've written about architecture, travel, and a wide range of topics. But the sad fact about this, about the food writing profession in particular, is that it's not a super lucrative one, which means that you will have to cast a wide net and keep an open mind. So you still want to be a food writer? If yes, then the most important things that you will need are endless curiosity, a good appetite, and a lot of perseverance. Because in this job, you will encounter a lot that is extremely unfamiliar to you and at times uncomfortable. Um, and you will encounter rejection again and again and again. Um, but it will change your perspective on the world. And that is a good thing. It may not be a dream job, but it can still be a pretty sweet deal. Thank you so much for your time. That's all from me. Thanks, Melinda. One more uh, thing, though, is I will be launching a writing workshop um, in early 2020, probably January 2022. Sorry, 2020. I meant 2022. The jet lag is really getting to me. So um, please check for updates on my Twitter feed at Melinda Joe. But if you just want to see a bunch of food pictures, then please have a look at my Instagram. 
Thanks, Melinda. Uh, we got a few questions from the chat. Uh, first one is from Joan Bailey. What mm -hmm. kinds of classes have you taken, which you mentioned in number four as part of the investment? Oh, so I have taken classes with the W set. Um, that's the the um, for my wine certification. I've also taken classes for sake with John Gontner. Um, I have taken other classes related to writing. I have also invested in a lot of books. So I've, you know, I'm, my whole house is books, not only related to food and drinks, but um, also to the craft of writing. Uh, next question here is from Mark and Dave. Do you only write positive reviews about the foods you like or the ones you hate? Do you write about them as well, showing your disdain for them in the article? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so in general, for for restaurants, um, I will I would prefer to write only positive things about restaurants. I mean, so the reason I say that is that um, there are lots of like there are lots of places that I visit, and I don't love them all. But I also don't have endless like sources. I, I don't have endless um, outlets that where I can publish everything. So when I have a choice and when I have the opportunity to write about something, I'm going to choose to showcase the place that I had a good experience and liked rather than one that I didn't. And if the if if there are if there is like a place that is like extremely hyped but like I feel like I had a really bad experience or you know um or I or I really disagree with the way with the way they're working then I would write something about that but like in but in general like um, if I'm going to choose to write about a place I'm going to choose to to promote and highlight places that I think are doing really great work and one more question here from the chat. Um, Mark Hovain wants to know why you if why you prefer Twitter over Instagram. Why I prefer Twitter over Instagram is because it's um it's because it's text based. Um, so if I I mean if I'm sharing something, then it's like I'm sharing information, and that could be in the form of an article. It could be podcasts. It could be any interesting you know any interesting piece of media that I have um, consumed. And then I can have interactions with people based on that. But Instagram, of course, like Instagram is a great tool, um, but Instagram, because it's um, image-based, um, a lot of times people are not reading the actual content below the photo. And so what they're engaging, what they're engaging with is like, is, is something that is very different. And this is from Kartika. When I pitch, should I have a writing sample related to food or can I show my writing blog in any topics? Okay, that's also a good question. Um, anytime that you're pitching, if you have a clip that is related to the topic or related to the kind of writing that you wanna do, then you should include that pitch. But um, again, if you are a relatively new writer and you don't have a lot of if you don't have a lot of clips, then just show what you have. Um, generally speaking, the the thing that I would do is to include two or three clips, and that just you know you just want to choose what you think are great examples of your work. So don't focus too much on it have you know it having to be related to the topic or related to that kind of writing. Just make sure that they are the best examples of your work that you have. And also like if you're just if you're trying to show your blog, for example, maybe don't just send the whole blog pick out a couple of um, articles or a couple of pieces from your blog and then send those links. Uh, next one from Tom Baker has the pandemic limited your ability to eat out or travel, if so, how have you dealt with that. Yeah, um, I would say that in the early days of the pandemic in particular, I was really affected because all of my work got canceled. <laughs> I mean, you know, as I told you, I was traveling so much for the pandemic and I had like three months of, um, of events and um, stories lined up. Um, when the pandemic hit, of course, like, you know, it cut off travel, re restaurants closed and, um, and, 
And also a lot of media outlets stopped assigning free freelancers stories, particularly um, for people overseas. So, um, so yeah, I, um, I was affected by that in the early days, but then um, luckily, you know, being here in Tokyo, which is really one of the best cities to be in if you're a food writer, um, we didn't have a hard lockdown. So I was still able to go to places um, here and, um, and try to support some of the people in this industry, you know, um, either like by, you know, going and eating at their restaurants and spending money, but also to try and like, you know, um, write some stories about them too, to show people, you know, what we're doing here and how we were still surviving. But um, also I feel like it was a little bit lucky that the, the, the Olympics was here. So that opened up some more opportunities to, to work again, um, even internationally, because um, since Japan has been closed to international travelers, uh, you know, a lot of people would not be interested in stories from Japan other, um, you know, other than the, the fact that we were having the Olympics. So that was kind of lucky for me. Uh, Zoria says that as a travel writer, she empathizes with everything you said. Written articles got killed even for airline magazines. And then uh, Patrick Murphy's got a question here. Uh, he's a travel writer. Some of the places he works for are having him do more and more writing about food. Mm -hmm. When they give him an assignment, he struggles with finding restaurants. What advice do you have for going out and finding a good restaurant? Oh, um, going out and finding good restaurants. Well, I mean, you have to do some research uh, by like first looking, there's so many resources for this. So, you know, just like try to find out what, um, like what is interesting or what is new, especially if you're in the travel sector, that means that there'll be like looking for like, what, what are some of the new openings? And I mean, you can really find that kind of information a lot. I mean, just anywhere, but if you're in Japan, then, you know, of course, take a look at the Japanese language um, magazines to get some ideas and, um, you know, connect with other people who are writing about food on social media. Um, and, you know, then just start hitting the pavement and going around looking for places that look interesting to you, duck your head in, take a look at the menu, and then, you know, try them. Okay, uh, Mark and Dave have another question. Go ahead, guys. Hi, uh, Melinda, how about a book uh, based on your writing, what are your ideas for putting out some sort of book? You know, a lot of people ask me about books. At this moment, I wouldn't say that there is one particular topic that I feel really passionate enough to make the investment to, to write a book on. Um, of course, it's always in my mind, but um, at, at, this, at this juncture, I, I don't have any strong inclination to write a book. Okay, okay uh, we have about two minutes left. Does anyone else have uh, any questions? Okay, I guess not. Um, oh wait, here's one more. Uh, this is from Sarah Fujimura. Have you watched the Japanese TV show Kantoro, the Sweet Tooth Salary Man? Oh, I haven't, but it sounds super interesting. I'll take a look. Um, thank you so much for everybody for your questions and for taking the time to listen to my presentation. All right, thank you. Could everyone else uh, give, uh, please give Melinda a round of applause. And uh, that does it for uh, for this the final session for this room. There's also going to be the happy hour session from four to six. I'll post the link in the chat in case anyone hasn't gotten that. All right, thanks everyone.